He is the drummer for the number one selling duo in music history. Brian Dunn has played drums for Daryl Hall and John Oates since 2012. Brian grew up in a musical family where his two older brothers played instruments. I met up with Brian on a Hall and Oates tour bus in New Hampshire. My brother Kevin was playing drums and my brother John was playing guitar when I was really small, little, little, little. So there was always band rehearsals in the house, there were always people playing instruments, so that was it. Since there was a drum kit set up, for as long as I can remember, I'd go down in the basement and just, you know, knock around. Who were some of your earlier drum influences? Probably the first, the first stuff I remember playing along with is the Ronnie Montrose record. Really? Yeah, which ironically, uh, Sammy Hagar was the singer on that record. Like Rock Candy literally is like some of the first stuff I ever played. So that's Danny Carmassi playing yeah. drums on that. Um, and I'm trying to think. Did you tell Sammy that when you played? I did, I did. It was, I couldn't wait to tell him that. <laughs> I mean, he told us, he said, you know, Rock Candy is something that throughout his career, and when he meets other musicians, they always seem to mention that song, you know? And, and I was like, I know well, I'm going to be yet another one to tell you that, but that's literally my first memories of playing the drums, though. Yeah. You know, that intro to Rock Candy, that double bass drum thing, yeah. and I can remember my brother practicing it, learning how to do it, you know? So. What would you say was a game-changing moment or moments in your career? Hard to think, man. I, I, I can tell you this. There's a, there's a, there is a game-changing moment, and it has nothing to do with uh, me uh, getting an opportunity. It, ha more, it has more to do with seeing another drummer. Um, I don't know if you know who Zach Danziger is, but um, when I was, I believe, 16 years old, I was still in high school, I went to see the Michelle Camilo Trio at a club called McKell's in Manhattan. And... I assumed it was going to be either Dave or Joel Rosenblatt at the time, um, and it was Zach Danziger, and so this was like 87 maybe, and I walk in that little club and there's a kid playing the drums who looked like he was my age, <laughs> I mean he was, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure he's, if he's not my age, he's close to my age, and uh, and at the time, I had no idea who he was, you know. And I watched that gig, and I was like, "Oh my God!" Because he sound he was he wasn't playing great for someone who's 16. He was just killing it. So, in a, in a in an ironic way, I guess that was game changing for me because I had never seen somebody young like that yeah. playing that way. And it was, it was, so that was kind of game changing because it kicked my ass yeah, yeah, to yeah. a degree that it had never been whipped before. So it was a great thing for me. Yeah. Anyway, it made me like say, wow, I have so much work to do. Speaking of work to do, <laughs> uh, so you had a stint with the average white band. Yeah. How'd that go? Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Really, really great. Yeah. Really great. Great, amazing guys amazing music and uh, so much fun to play that stuff as a drummer yeah. just ridiculous yeah, yeah. So was there a time, if there wasn't a game-changing moment, was there some time where you said, wow, I'm actually, I'm making this, this is, this is work? Um, you know what, I, maybe, maybe my, my first couple of gigs with a, a great jazz guitar player named Chuck Loeb, I was in his band for a lot of years, and he, uh, I joined his band after Zach, actually. Zach Denzinger had been the drummer of his band, and uh, I came after Zach, 
and um, you know, ridiculous shoes to fill. I didn't even come close to filling them. <laughs> but having said that, um, in the very first couple of gigs I did with Chuck, uh, Will Lee was playing bass. And for me, that was monumental. It's still monumental when I get to play with him. <laughs> but at the time, I, I was probably 21, 22, around that, that age. And, and uh, playing with Will was like, wow, are you kidding me? <laughs> so yeah, that was one of those yeah. moments. You know, you start to say to yourself, okay, I guess I'm, you know, it's working. Whatever I'm doing is, must be okay. Yeah, so definitely. yeah. Who was your first really big successful gig with? I would say Chuck Lowe. Chuck Lowe was the first, like he, he made a huge difference in, in, in my entire career because he, had, he carries a lot of weight. So if you were known to have played with him, it means a lot. Um, the first pop gig, the first sort of national artist I ever like did a tour like this with was with a girl named Alana Davis. And that was in 1997, 98. I'm a huge fan of her. So at Near Z. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did like when 32 Flavors was kind of like, yeah. you know, Gene Lake, the drummer Gene Lake, he was in the band before me. Okay. Um, you know, that record, Near did the record. Right. And, and then she started touring, she started doing all the television shows because 32 Flavors was a pretty big hit. Yeah. And shortly after they, they started touring, um, I joined the band after Gene. Right. Again, more <laughs> stupid shoes to fit, <laughs> to fill. It's crazy. I always wind up on the back end of... Same thing with Average White Band. Adam Deitch was there before yeah. me, so it's like I'm put in impossible situations. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Alana. That was the first sort of pop yeah. gig I had done. Yeah. But Chuck, I have to say, to me, Chuck was the one that helped, um, I guess, put me on the map for what, you know. Is there a song you guys will be performing tonight that you say, you know, this is one I really look forward to playing? Sarah Smile. Really? That's my favorite Hall & Oates tune. A lot of drummers like the fast tunes, but that's... Uh... Oh, no, I like Sarah Smile. <laughs> cool. I love playing that stuff. I love playing that kind of feel, and yeah. I'm... A little 16th note group. I, I just love the tune, so it's... Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful song. Yeah. So the show, Gerald's House, you've recorded with a lot of cool artists on that show. Yeah. How has your uh, musical upbringing prepared you for all the different styles? It's, it's totally prepared me because my brother, because, my, because of guys like Steve Gadd and Vinny and all the usual suspects, um, my brother was into listening to records and reading the liner notes and starting to recognize seeing the same names on a lot of different stuff. And that was, like, I personally, I never started playing drums so I could be in a band <laughs> and like tour like that was the last thing on my mind I wanted to be the guy that was playing with all these different artists and playing on records that's that's what I was trying to do um, and I like I'm a fan of too many different styles of music so it was hard for me to I'm not satisfied playing just one style of music so um, I grew up around two older brothers that were constantly like my brother would be would would I remember my brother would like when he was into James Brown for a he would get into one thing for for like m a couple of months and like really get in there or if it was Shaka Khan or it with J.R. Robinson or um, or when he went through his phase of listening to Clifford Brown and that's when we that's we started listening to Max Roach it was because of those Clifford Brown Max Roach records and he would just jump into one thing one era or one genre and I was the recipient of that I just whatever my brothers did I would check out you know what I mean so never knowing that I'd wind up on a show where I'd have to play with all these different styles of music and all these different artists, so it, it, it definitely worked out. I think a lot of guys grow up that way now, though. I think a lot of drummers are, 
growing up checking out because there's so many great players in different genres. Yeah. You know, if you're serious about the drums, I think you have to be listening to at a certain point in your life. You have to be checking out Steve Jordan or Charlie Drayton, and you have to be checking out Bill Stewart or Brian Blade. And that and that's a there's a massive divide between those two and those two rights. Completely different styles of music. But like if you're serious about this, you need to be checking people like that out. You know what I mean? So Did you listen to a lot of people, do you think that really helped you a lot? Yeah, because you can't help but then check out the music that they're playing. Mm -hmm. So you're getting a little bit of that a little you, you grab a little a little flavor from everything. Yeah. You know? What was the most magical moment for you for the show? Was there a particular artist that you said, wow, this is so cool? I guess I guess the the artist that there was a there was a moment during uh, the Joe Walsh episode that yeah just like it was sort of a, I don't know he, he it just felt like wow this dude's a rock star like it felt that had that feel I don't even know what that means but that's what it felt like <laughs> like damn and he had such a loose nothing to prove vibe. And that was cool. And what that did to the room was cool. A lot of the more epic artists have that. The seasoned artists um, come in and they're usually like that. Billy Gibbons was that way. Yeah. They're just like, yeah, man, let's play some music. It's like there's no, yeah. there's no bullshit. Just yeah. That's so fine. it's say yeah. It's, okay. <laughs> it's us. Yeah. I mean, and there's been other episodes that have been I've thought were really good though like I'm I thought that the Gavin DeGraw episode was cool I'm a fan of his singing and 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 the girl uh, um, Grace Potter yeah. I thought she was killing and this and the other girl other girl Grace I think her name was we Grace from Australia yeah. wow I like I go back and listen to that and it's where, like I, I, she was killing I say, where do they find some of these people they're so awesome and yeah they're who researches and gets the people yeah, I don't know how that That's works. Daryl, I think at this point, it's there are artists and management people that are calling Daryl's people, saying, on. we want to get on. Yeah. I think in the beginning of this show, they were looking for people. Now, the people want to get on this show. Yeah, that's what, it, how, what it's become. Easily, I left it out, but easily one of my per musical highlights um, because I got to do a session and play live and blow with Michael Brecker, um, who I'm a huge fan of. I might be more of a Michael Brecker fan than any drummer. <laughs> he did that. He was the man for me. And um, uh, Mike Pope is a great bass player, um, who actually was the first guy to join the electric band after Patitucci stopped doing it. And uh, he, it was his solo record, and he hired Brecker, and I was in his band at that point. So we did a tune, and it featured, it featured him and me, yeah. and it was live. And it was, it was, that was as exciting a day, and it was the day of the O.J. Simpson trial. <laughs> wow. Never forget, because we were sitting upstairs, we had a television on, and we were listening back to what we had just played. Wow. Yep. <laughs> yep. What advice would you have for a young drummer if they were going to get into this crazy business? Uh, How can they have success? Yeah, I mean, you have to... If you're considering doing this for a living and considering anything else, even this much, don't do this. <laughs> That's my advice. My advice is, you only do this if you have to do this. You know what I mean? Like, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're a great musician, let's say you're in high school and you're super talented, but you're also super smart, a lot of times that happens. And you're like, okay, well, I can go to like an engineering school and I can, I can pretty much get into any university I want to doing this. And... If you're, if, if you're sitting there going, mm, not sure, 
sure which way I should go. Your, to me, your decision has been made. Because if you're going to take this route, you got to have to do this. Because there's a whole lot of, uh, you know, unless you're extremely lucky, there's a whole lot of times where it's not so good, even if you're great. So you gotta wanna, re you gotta really love it and and need to do it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because then that will carry you through. You can spend ten years of doing shit and then get one opportunity, and that can change everything. Right. But who's willing to go through that? And to me, the people that are willing to go through that and that do go through it successfully are the ones that have to do it. There can be nothing else. Yeah. And so. It's a tough. Yeah, it's, it's tough. really tough. It's really tough. I mean, because I, I know too many people that are easily can do what I do, and they're not doing what I'm doing. And that, I'm not even kidding. That is not, that is 100% honest. There are so many people that can do this at a high level, and they don't have, they just haven't gotten that opportunity. So, I mean, and part of that is their own fault. I'm not saying that it's a totally luck. It's not. You have to, you have to, you have to get with a lot of different circles of people. You have to, you have to be open to playing different kinds of music. You can't just practice 19 hours a day and never leave your house. There's a whole social aspect to this. Right. You need to be seen. You need to be seen playing, most importantly. But even if you're not playing, you should be around. You should just be around. You got to be around it. You know, because first impressions are huge. There was a piano player named, there is a piano player named Charles Blenzig. He used to play every Monday night at a club in Manhattan called Sweet Basil's with the Gil Evans Orchestra. Kenwood Denard was the drummer. Amazing band. And I used to go every Monday to see that. Before I went to see that band, this guy came to my college and did a clinic, and I played with him a little bit. And he was like, oh, shit. All right, you should. Who are you? You should. Play, you around and blah. And we got to talk, and he's like, "Oh, I play every. I play every uh, Monday night. It was Mondays at Sweet Basil's." I said, "I'm coming." He said, "Kenwood Denard is a drummer." I'm like, "Kenwood Denard? Like, I, I love Kenwood Denard." So I used to go down there, and I was in college. It was my first semester in college, so I was 18 years old. I'd go into the city, and I'd watch this, these freaks of nature play, and I was there uh, every week. And, and this guy was cool enough to always come to me and talk to me. And that, that's where it ended. I never got to sit in, nothing. I, but just from being around, like a year later, I met this sax player at a jam session. And he's like, oh, yeah, you're the, oh, yeah, I see you around all the time, man. What's up? And, and I could tell, as phony as it sounds, I can tell that in his mind, for wrong or right, I don't care, in his mind, he already was looking for a reason to like me. He want, when we started playing, he was looking for a reason to, for, as to why I'm around these guys. I must be one of them. So instead of thinking and instead of critically listening like, this motherfucker is going to have to prove himself to me, it was no. It was the opposite. It was like, yeah, I see you around all the time, man. Yeah, let's play. And it was, it was, a, it was starting, out, starting out in a positive way. Yeah. You know? And I had to like, I, it was up to me to ruin it. <laughs> So if I could play, yeah. it, then it was even the cherry on top. Yeah. So it's those type of scenarios. If you're not in that kind of scenario, you're not going to go anywhere. Yeah. That's, you know, that's just one example, but that's being out. You have to get out, and you have to meet people, and you have to play. Did so, you, did did you, you woodshed work? a lot, though? Did you practice yeah, your ass off? I practiced a lot. Yeah. I mean, when I was up through high school, mm -hmm. I was I didn't really practice a lot. Unfortunately, I now I really regret it. I wish I did, but playing certain things kind of certain things kind of came easy. Um, I mean, not, I shouldn't say easy, but I was playing along with like I can remember like when I was in sixth grade, I was playing the Rush Hemispheres record, you know, and that was like complicated stuff of 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 its time, right? And I was playing that stuff, and whatever my brothers would give me, I would just play along with it, but. It was very surfacey. It wasn't deep, yeah. you know? And I didn't realize that until I was a senior in high school and I went to see Zach Danziger play <laughs> with Michelle Camille and I was like, oh, oh, okay, like, yeah, I'm a child. Yeah, that's a lot more and, then I, and then I really started practicing, yeah. like a lot, yeah. a, a lot. Like yeah. get up in the morning and practice all day. 
until, like, in the summers I could do this when I wasn't in school. I mean, all day. Eat dinner, practice until, you know, 9 o'clock at night, and that was every single day. At home or did you have a spot? I was at home. My parents were so cool. The only, the only rule in the house was don't start playing before 9 a.m. Don't, don't, don't keep playing past 9 p.m. You want to bash all day? Have at it. I've been doing this forever. Yeah. Yeah. Don't get out of music, dude. <laughs> I, I was just playing music. I mean, I, I mean, having a certain skill set, yeah. knowing that you can teach yeah. long after the playing days. I yeah. mean, I'm assuming now that as my as I get older, unless you're a jazz player, yeah. but if you're a pop player, as you're as you get older, you become less employ employable. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, in the big picture, mm -hmm. with well, some rock and roll stuff, you can go on and on and on. But like you know, at, once I'm in my mid fifties, the chances of me doing a gig with an artist that's like, you know, like whoever Justin Timberlake 10 years from now is yeah. going to be, yeah. is going to be very slim. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, as I play less, I'll probably start teaching more. Yeah. And that was the reverse. At, when I was on my way up, I guess, I was teaching a lot. Yeah. And that's, but that was to make ends meet financially. Yeah. You know? So I was always teaching, and then as I became more busy playing and touring, and now the teaching has kind of gone away. What are a couple of sessions that you're really proud of? If, like, that you would tell people, hey, check this out. This would be a good uh, one if you want to hear my playing. Well, one of them is definitely, the first thing that comes to mind for me is a Chuck Loeb record um, that has, it's a hidden track. <laughs> because Chuck's music was played a lot on the radio, smooth jazz radio, and Chuck's earlier music um, where Zach was the drummer, it was more, there was more freedom, it was more, excite, more excitement, less radio friendly, mm -hmm. a little more fusion-y. And we did a tune on one of his records and the record label was like, you, this is cool, but we're, we're never going to play this. Yeah. But he was so proud of it that he was like, I can't not put this on a record. So he put it on one of his records and like if, if I think if the last track on the record is number 12, if you let it play on the CD player, all of a sudden it goes 13, 14, 15, boom. I went to a community school for two years, and I, I did classical percussion. Um, and, and then another two years and got a music ed degree. So I, I went and got certified to teach instrumental band K through 12. Nice. <laughs> but I never used it. I never used it. Wow. I, I actually planned on never using it. But that was more of a... Um, it, 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 I, I want to call it a plan B, but I never really had a plan B. But my parents desperately wanted me to have a plan B. So I, I sort of acquiesced to what I knew they wanted yeah. for safety. Yeah. But I kind of was like, oh, I'll, I'll get this ed degree, but I'm playing music for a living. I'm not even, con I never even made a decision to play music for a living. Yeah. I just, there's just been no other option. It's just, yeah. just it, couldn't imagine anything else. So. And with the way he plays his drums, we're glad he plays music too. On drums, Brandon. For Drumheads and Tails, I'm Bob Evans.